Well, thank you very much for examining the depth of our psyche together. It's always, always a fun time. <laughs> I learn, I feel like I learn a lot about myself as when I open my mouth and something comes out that I wasn't planning on <laughs> saying. So. Welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to-be-read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Kareen from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning, this podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. We are live, everyone. Welcome, welcome, everyone, to another episode of Keep It Fictional. My name is Sadie, and I am here joined today by four of my absolutely amazing colleagues and librarians and we are here once again to talk books. We are here today to talk a somewhat controversial topic in the book world. Maybe, maybe a controversial topic in the book world. But before we get to that, I would like to introduce to you uh, my wonderful colleagues. We have Fiona, Liz, Kareen, and Virginia. So welcome everyone. I am very excited to talk about our topic today. I'm very interested and curious uh, exactly where this discussion is going to go. Um, Cause I feel like this is a topic that people have feelings on. There are feelings and there are opinions and um, yeah, so I'm very curious. So I will keep you in suspense no longer. Today, we are talking about something that I really, really enjoy. And that is when books are adapted to film or to TV shows. So when books are turned into a visual medium with actors and production teams and directors and all of that wonderful thing, the soundtracks, all of the things that go into making a TV show or a movie or a mini series or however they are chosen to be adapted. Now, for myself, I really, really enjoy this because when I really like a book, when I really like a series, I just want to be able to go into that world more and to spend more time in that world, to spend more time with those characters. And so by having an adaptation made, it allows me to do that. It allows me to spend more time with those characters and spend more time um, in, in that world, which is one of the reasons why I really like adaptations. But not everyone does. Um, and I think that we might find some, some potentially differing opinions uh, today for these. Um, so I'm curious, just kind of right off the bat, are we, you can even just do a thumbs up, thumbs down if you don't want to get too much into it. How do we feel generally about um, book to, to film adaptations? <laughs> I mean, if you feel like you can, if you can um, control yourself and, and the rage that might come with this question. <laughs> All right. So I'm seeing a couple thumbs down. Let me see your, let me see your responses again. I see a thumbs up and two thumbs down, two thumbs up and one right in the middle. All right. All right. Maybe we'll, we'll see, uh, we'll see how Liz, how Liz feels when she's allowed to unmute herself and, uh, <laughs> and talk a bit more about it. <laughs> But on that note, I'm going to switch it over to Fiona to see which uh, book she's going to talk about today. Oh, yes. And I should let you all know that this is all about books that are being turned into movies or TV shows this year. So this is all about stuff that is upcoming uh, that we may be excited about that we may not be excited about um, the adaptation of it. So this is all about 2021 releases. So Fiona, what did you bring today? So I brought a book that I'm very excited about, just finished. Um, it's actually one that Virginia brought to my attention. Uh, it is Set My Heart to Five by Simon Stevenson. Uh, so I know Virginia talked about this as when she was looking forward to, I think, as a, as a fall release. And it did not disappoint. It was very funny uh, and just, just generally enjoyable. So this book is about an android in the year 2054. Uh, Jared is a bot who works as a dentist. Um, there are some jobs that bots are just much better at. Uh, dentist is one of them. Doctor is not because 
Bots don't have great bedside manner, but dentist is perfect. It's all uh, just, just mechanical things that they can do. However, one day Jared finds himself with a number in his word cloud. And he soon realizes that that number represents how many teeth he will see over how many days until he is retired as a bot. This number is the beginning of feelings for Jared. He finds he is dreading the future. And luckily he has a doctor friend who takes him in and does some psychoanalysis and diagnoses him as being depressed. This is hilarious to Jared because of course bots do not have feelings, therefore they cannot be depressed. Throughout, we, uh, we, get to, we get to experience um, the feelings that Jared has along with him as he, as he feels all these things for the very first time. And eventually he is found out and the Bureau of Robotics is, uh, recalls him. However, rather than a give in to that, he decides to flee to California where he will write a perfect screenplay that will cause humans to be sympathetic for bots with feelings. So that's sort of um, the, the path that he follows. And the whole thing is, uh, is from his perspective. Um, and it's just very funny and cheeky, this sort of observation of how ridiculous humans are. However, there are some spots that are written as uh, screenplay scenes. So I think it's going to make an excellent adaptation um, because it's also all about films. Uh, Jared learns to identify his feelings through watching old films from mostly the 80s and the 90s. And this, and uh, in this time, this uh, post-crash world in which um, Elon Musk has blown up the moon, watching those old movies makes you a nostalgic and it's sort of frowned upon because... Uh, what's popular in, in uh, the current time is killer bot movies. So um, Jared watches these old movies, uh, learns the mechanics of writing a screenplay, um, and has all sorts of adventures in California. Yeah, like I said, I think it's going to be a great adaptation uh, for an ad adaptation because it already has some scenes in it um, written as screenplay. And because it's all kind of from his perspective, you don't get a lot of details on like what characters are like. So I'm really excited to see how those are interpreted because you get to see all inside of his mind, but to actually have a visual aspect of it um, and more dialogue, I think is gonna be really exciting. So it is to, going to be directed uh, by Edgar Wright, who did Scott Pilgrim, he did Baby Driver um, and all the, the Cornello series. And so I'm curious as to whether Simon Pegg is going to be the lead in this. It's like I have, I think he'd like have the humor and like be very endearing, but I'd also love to see it played by somebody else. So I, I'm really curious about that. Um, and the uh, Simon Stevenson who wrote the book is actually going to be writing the screenplay. So I think that's great. As, as it says in the book, you know, it is every screenplay writer's worst nightmare that uh, they will be kicked off their own movie and someone else will write it. Definitely an enjoyable book, um, but I'm not gonna forget about it quickly because I'm really looking forward to this movie uh, and I can't wait to see it realized. When does it come out, Fiona? Did you say that? <laughs> you found me out. <laughs> There's no release date. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it's imminent. <laughs> so some at some point, at some point, possibly mm -hmm. this year, Mm -hmm. <laughs> excellent no that sounds uh that sounds like a like you said I think that would make a good adaptation when it's already kind of written in that way now do you know um or does anyone know does that author have a background in screenwriting yeah so he's listed as um writing for previously writing for Pixar uh, when I went to his IMDB though the only thing I recognized was Paddington 2 um so we'll see <laughs> great <laughs> excellent well thank you so much Fiona we are now going to go to Liz to see which book to movie adaptation she is talking about today 
So I had a bit of a hard time choosing a uh, book that would be adapted into a movie in 2021. Earlier, I proclaimed I was kind of on the fence about adaptations because they could either be really, really good or they could be really, really bad. Um, so I decided to go with a story that I had never read before. Um, and this one was originally published in 1929 and takes place in the 20s in New York City. Now, this one is called Passing, uh, and it was written by Nella Larson. This story focuses around Irene Redfield and Claire Kendry. They were childhood friends who grew up together, and they both came from biracial backgrounds. Claire's family had met with some tragedy, so she moved out of the community. Um, so it's been a long time since Irene has seen Claire, in fact, over a decade. So they are both adults now and both uh, with their own families. One day by chance, Claire and Irene happen to run into each other. At first, Irene doesn't quite recognize Claire. It's been so long, there have been many rumors swirling about what had happened to her, but Claire seems to be doing very well. And as they get reacquainted with each other, it comes about that Claire has been passing as white, while Irene has fully embraced her African-American heritage. So to complicate matters even more, Claire's husband, who is white, does not know that Claire is passing. This is a huge secret. They've had a child together. And in the story, she reveals her relief that her child could also pass as completely white. So as the two women become reacquainted with each other, Claire ingratiates herself into Irene's social circle. It seems that she has a longing to reconnect with her African-American heritage and to spend time in another world, essentially. Her life, Claire's life with her husband has been one of living in Europe and basically not having any restrictions placed against her because of perceived race or her social standing. So this foray back into the community from which she lived originally with Irene uh, seems to be bring her much joy. However, she still needs to keep this a secret from her husband because as Irene had found out, Claire's husband is incredibly racist. He even assumes that Irene herself is white until one day he runs into Irene who is shopping with a mutual friend who cannot pass. And that is when he has a revelation. Anyways, not to get ahead of ourselves here. This is definitely a story about race and identity. It's about whiteness and class jealousy. It, it deals with a lot of heavy topics that were prevalent, particularly during the day passing was a thing. And brought it brought so many complications with it, including people's sense of who they were and being torn between two different worlds, being true to themselves and trying to find a place within the greater society. This really excited me to see that it was going to become a movie because it's got a fantastic cast. It premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, so they did screenings um, at the end of January of this year, and it stars Tessa Thompson, who was in Thor, Ruth Nega, also an actress of great acclaim, Andre Holland, who is in Moonlight, um, as well as Alexander Skarsgård, who plays Claire's unsuspecting, at least initially, husband. So definitely interested to see how this plays out on the screen, transporting us back in time to 1920s New York and seeing how the relationship between the two women um, kind of dances around um, the issue of race and class. Well, thank you, Liz. That definitely, that sounds like a, it will be a very powerful um, and uh, I think timely and important film. All right, well, we have heard from someone who likes adaptations. We have heard from someone who's on the fence of adaptations. 
Next, we're going to go to Corrine, who at the beginning of this episode gave me a thumbs down for adaptation. So I'm curious which book you are talking about today, Kareen. Um, I think that for adaptations, we can be interested in the adaptation, but might not necessarily be as excited as we were about the book. So it'll be interesting uh, to see what book you are bringing to us today. Such a polite way of phrasing that, Sadie. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> very delicate light touch on kind of dancing around the issue oh well I'm definitely talking about a book that I'm never going to see the movie of I'm going to be honest <laughs> um but I'll talk about that later um so in the 1920s the average annual death rate in the United States was 8.5 per thousand people so that is in a thousand people 8.5 of them on average would be expected to pass away from various causes in the 1920s for the Assage Nation, their annual death rate was 19 in 1,000 people. And that shouldn't have been. So the Assage Nation had originally been hounded from their ancestral territories by settlers and by the US government, had eventually relocated to Kansas in the 1870s and were again driven from their territory by white settlers to uh, settle in a kind of barren place in uh, Oklahoma that was described by an agent as a broken, sterile land unfit for cultivation. However, the tribe themselves had no choice. They had to find a land, and in fact, they had to purchase a land from the Cherokee nations where their people could live. And for many years, they barely survived. There was starvation because, of course, the land was not fertile enough to sustain people. The government refused to give any assistance for them that was promised. However, all of this changed when, in the turn of the century, oil was discovered on their land. And not just a little oil, but one of the largest and most lucrative oil deposits in the United States. Now, due to a far-seeing uh, member of their community, the Assange people retained the mineral rights of their own land. So when oil was discovered, they leased the land to the white prospectors while retaining the land and the royalties from that oil. As a result, by the 1920s, the Assange people were one of the richest people in America. So in 1920, the tribe took, a, took in about $30 million, which in today's money would be about $400 million. And because of the structure that the U.S. government had imposed on them, all of that money was divided between the tribally enrolled members of the nation. So every person who was recognized as an Assage member was given what was called a head right which was essentially every year they would be given a share of the profits. So why in the 1920s were they one of the richest nations, one of the most prosperous regions in the world, and yet their death toll was so high? What David Gran explains in his book, Killers of the Flower Moon, is that during this time, there was a systematic conspiracy to murder members of the Assage Nation to take their head right and steal their money. It is, it is a very hard story to read um, because the actual amount of people killed is unknown. The conspiracy involved lawmakers, it involved politicians, it involved doctors. In a time in the 1920s where forensics were not sophisticated and the law was not prepared to deal with a mass killing on this scale with so many perpetrators. What David Grand does really well is tie this to the people. So it talks about Molly Burkhart, who first, her youngest sister, then her older sister, then her mother, and then her children are slowly killed off by people who want access to that head right. 
I, I will kind of give a warning. The language in this book is a little rough. It is the accurate language that people were using in the 1920s, but they use terminology that is unacceptable for us reading right now. Um, what I think this book does really powerfully is that um, as you kind of go through the history of the 1920s of trying to uncover what happened and slowly um, J. Edgar Hoover um, gets involved in this kind of ties into the founding of the FBI um, is that he goes back to the reserve now and talks to the people who are still living there and says that every single family there knows someone that was murdered during what is called the Assage Reign of Terror. So this book has been optioned by Martin Scorsese. Um, it is going to be turned into a film apparently starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. Um, I'm going to head off Sadie's question and saying I don't know when the release date is. It's, it's not there yet. While the pedigree of these filmmakers is impeccable, I actually don't think it's a story that they should be telling. I don't think it should be a non-native person telling this story. I really think that it should be an indigenous filmmaker who would take this because I feel like considering the big names that are involved, it's going to center on the wrong people. It's going to be telling the wrong story. So I am a little bit hesitant about this film. I don't, I don't think I'll, I'll see it. Um, but as a read, it is, it is very, very powerful to watch kind of white supremacy and colonialism at work in the 1920s and then draw parallels to what is happening right now um, in the United States and in Canada um, when Indigenous people try to assert their rights over their own land. So it's a it's a great read. It's a tough read, um, but it's really good. If you're kind of interested in the subject, there's a wonderful um, book that came out just recently called Yellow Bird which is Oil, Murder, and a Woman's Search for Justice in Indian Country by Sierra Crane Murdoch, um, which kind of explores the same thing is when oil is discovered on um, First Nations or Indigenous lands, the impact to it. So yeah, that that is my pick, Sadie. That is my pick. And I'm sorry to say I'm definitely not going to see that movie. <laughs> I think that that's completely fair. I, it's an interesting, when you said Scorsese, I had this horrible reaction to his name being attached to that story because his work is, it's so, it can be very sensationalist. It can be very over the top in a way that would take that story and turn it into something that is not taken seriously for what it is. Yeah. In, in the case of many stories that are about first nations or indigenous people, it always centers kind of like the white settler experience and considering, you know, that is part of the story of how, how the justice system kind of eventually found out the people that were per perpetuating a lot of the killers. I don't think that that's the main story that needs to be told about this. I would tend to agree with you on that one, Corrine. Uh, thank you for, for bringing at least the book to my attention. I, I did, I had never, I didn't know that story at all. So thank you for that. And I think I am with you on um, probably not going to, to see the movie on that one. <laughs> all right. Well, it is time in our book chat for us to approach our, existential, controversial, anger-inducing question? We'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so our question for today that I have posed to my colleagues is, do you prefer when books are adapted to TV shows or to movies? And do you think that one medium fits a book better? Does anyone have any strong feelings that they would like to start off with? I have strong feelings. First of all, I like I like it all. Bad adaptations, good adaptations, it doesn't matter. It's just fun to like dissect them and you know where they went wrong because a lot of them do go wrong. <laughs> but I enjoy that. But hands down, the best way to do an adaptation is a mini series. I love I love like you know, like a three to six run between 50 minutes to an hour and 20 minutes, like mini series, you know, BBC does a bunch of great ones. There's like a good old David Copperfield. There's a lot of great Agatha Christie adaptations done in that way. I think that's like my favorite kind of TV regardless, but, and I, and I love adaptations. So I just, I think that that is... That's the perfect way to do it. Nice. Now, do you have a favorite adaptation that's been done in that way? 
Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> no worries. Maybe Bleak House. There's a really good adaptation of that. That's like maybe six episodes or something. And it's actually, I think, sorry, Dickens is such a great person to adapt because there was like so much of his stuff was serialized. There's just like so much unnecessary things. And like, like this adaptation of um, Bleak House with uh, Gillian Anderson, just like takes out all the unnecessary stuff, but it's long enough that it has like the great details. Does anyone else want to weigh in? Virginia, what, what is your thoughts on, I know you were one of the, our thumbs down at the beginning. Um, do you think that uh, TV or movies suits an adaptation better or are they all just not meant to be? Well, being the thumbs down person, yes, they're not all meant to be. I don't need them. Nothing, none of them need to exist. But I think if I have to choose, I guess a TV series maybe just give it a little more time. Maybe maybe it could be a mini series like Fiona said, but something, just give it a little more time to get acquainted with the characters, not rush it. The first time I watched Game of Thrones, I hated it. And that was before I read the book. I hated it because I was like, what is happening? Because the book was complicated, right? So there's just, it keeps switching point of views. And I'm just like, I don't care what is happening. Like, I, why, why, why should I care about any of these people? So I just stopped and I hated it. And it took me like a long time until I actually read the series. And I'm like, okay, so I got the background now. I got all the information I need. So then when I went back to see the show, I'm like, okay. But it's only because I have all that background already and which the book gives me, not the TV show. So I think even with an adaptation that I can tolerate, I'm still like, you don't need to exist because the book does it all. The books give me everything I need. And it's almost always disappointing because I already have everything in my mind. So it's always wrong in some ways or like when they pick things that are like, why would you emphasize that and skip over this part? Like what is going on? You know, and then you just, get annoyed so just saving myself from that frustration I was just like no I don't need I don't need any adaptations it's fine it's fair see I have fun kind of watching them and being like huh that's an interesting choice I wonder why they chose to do that (laughs) it has no bearing on how the story turns out making it go one way or the other but all right Oh, Liz, what about you? Do you think that one one works better? Do you prefer one over the other? Yeah. So like I like to say for pretty much everything, it depends. Um, with movies, you get that huge kind of epic sort of a look, um, which can be really great. You might have a bigger budget. And then you've got that sort of time constraint. So if you don't have a lot of time, you can get the gist of things. Or as with the TV series, you have the flexibility. Like Fiona said, with the time to show more. But yeah, interesting point that Virginia made about getting what you need in terms of the backstory from books. So in that case, if you're a book reader and maybe just want to see a glimpse of the world in a movie, that might work. If you want to do a deep dive, maybe TV series. Yeah, it depends. I prefer to judge on a case by case basis. That's fair. That's fair. I can understand that. And Kareen, what are your thoughts? TV, movies, neither, both? Oh, Sadie, you backed me into a corner. (laughs) All right. (sighs) Another true confessions time. These past few weeks have been very revelatory, I'm sure. Um, I don't like movies. They're too short. (laughs) I I don't care for them. They're too short. I don't like watching them. I might get attached to someone and then it's like over in an hour. What's the point? What's the point? I don't like them. It's every year we do like choose your your favorite book and your favorite movie that you've seen in the year. And it is always a struggle for me. I always end up picking a Fast and Furious movie because they're the only ones that I watch. So yeah, I'm a bit of a Philistine when it comes to this. I, I don't care for them. Again, like Virginia said, like why I, I just, I'm just getting to know you. We're just in the first flushes of our relationship and then you're gone. You're gone. I, I, I like the idea of movie adaptations because I do think that it makes more people go back to the book and read it before the movie comes out, which I love. I love that movies bring uh, more 
interest and they drive up sales of books and they make the the authors into superstars i love the attention that a big movie adaptation like brings to uh, brings to a book but yeah no it's going to be mini series it's obviously going to be mini series because it's longer than an hour and a half um yeah. The only movie that I have seen that was an adaptation that I really enjoyed was the movie Holes. Um, <laughs> Cause everyone was great. And Dulé, I love Dulé Hill. So I was like, excellent, excellent. So yeah. But again, like you cannot beat, you cannot beat the uh, Colin Firth, Jennifer L Pride and Prejudice. Like bless Kira Knightley for trying. Bless her. But it just didn't work. You need that like long, luxurious six hours of meandering time and like playing with ribbons and like slow walks through the countryside. You need that for it to work. So that's where I stand. Sadie, what about you? Um, I, I actually am going to agree with you, Corrine. So I am not, I, I enjoy movies, but if I'm going to sit down at home and choose to watch something, it will be a TV show because I can hand, like, not that I can ha can't handle the length of a movie, but I think it's almost the opposite for me. Whereas if I'm going to commit my time to something, I want to have an out at certain points. <laughs> and when it's a TV show, I can watch an hour and then maybe choose not to or choose to continue. Whereas the movie, it's just sometimes two hours or two and a half hours seems like a really big commitment for me. And I struggle with that. I sat down to watch Enola Holmes uh, the other night and it was like over two hours long. And I was, I did it. I did it. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I'm, I'm definitely a TV person. I like something that I can watch in short amounts of time, but commit to over a long period of time um, to have something kind of, whether it's released all at once or not, to have something that you can keep going back to and that you can, yeah, keep getting excited about. Uh, with the movie, it's it's there and it's over. And even Les Miserables, the movie, I, I watched it many times in theaters, but I have not watched it once since I've owned the DVD version of it. Because um, it's just too much of a commitment to sit down. So yes, I am agreeing with you, Green. <laughs> Even though I'll sit on my couch for hours scrolling randomly through my phone, it's not like I'm doing anything, but, uh, but yes, so I, um, I would agree with you. I am, I am a TV show person. I feel like we, we're all kind of, uh, I, I agree with Liz as well that it depends on, on the book, but I feel like we all might be leaning more towards TV shows or miniseries. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for examining the depth of our psyche together. It's always, always a fun time. <laughs> I learn. I feel like I learn a lot about myself as when I open my mouth and something comes out that I wasn't planning on <laughs> saying. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so for my choice, I have been very, very excited about uh, this adaptation coming out. It was announced who January of twenty. 19 possibly maybe 2020 it may have been 2020 um so i have been very excited about this there was no information for a really long time they finally cast it back last year and then everything was put on hold uh due to COVID, as so many things were uh, but they have finally set a release date and this is going to be released on netflix on april 23rd 2021 and that is lee bardugo's shadow and bone series uh, so I have talked about her second part of this series, her Six of Crows duology, which is uh, connected to the series. It is also going to be part of the adaptation. She has said herself that it is, it's not going to be the same as the books. So she has said that uh, she has been involved in the production. I don't know how much, but she has kind of said that it's, they're mixing the two stories together, so it's it's not going to be exactly the same as the books. But that's okay. I am still very, very excited about it. Um, and so Shadow and Bone is the first in her Grishaverse universe. Um, there is now three books in this series, two books in the Six of Crows series, and another two books in her King Nikolai series. Uh, the second one is coming out this March. Um, and Shadow and Bone follows uh, Lena Starkov, 
And Alina is an orphan who was raised in an orphanage that was set up in um, a Duke's household. And she grew up not alarmed a lot of people, but with one very close friend named Mal. And they grew up together. And when they were about eight years old, three people came to the orphanage and they were all wearing different colored robes. And this represented the fact that they were what are called Grisha. And Grisha are essentially, though they don't use this word, witches. And the Grisha are able to manipulate the energies around them in a magical kind of way. And they were in this orphanage to test Alina and to test Mal to see if one or both of them had any of these magical abilities. And if they did, they would be taken off to the palace to be trained in the Grisha army to protect the kingdom of Ravka. So they're both tested. Neither of them show any abilities whatsoever. So they leave and they go about their, their lives. Now, many, many years later, decade later, both Alina and Mal are working for uh, the army. Uh, Alina is an assistant cartographer. Mal is uh, one of the soldiers. And as part of their training, they are being made to cross what is called the Shadow Fold. The Shadow Fold is a part of the Kingdom of Ravka that is entirely in darkness. And it is ruled over and inhabited by these creatures called the Volcra. And they attack humans, they attack anyone who crosses the fold, but unfortunately, in order to get from one part of Ravka to the other part of Ravka, you have to cross this fold. So both Mal and Alina with their teams are crossing the fold and all of a sudden they start getting attacked by these creatures. Alina notices that Mal is about to be attacked and so she rushes over and all of a sudden a blinding flash of light kind of comes up around her and she passes out. She doesn't remember anything. When she comes to, she is brought before the entire army and the head of the Grisha army called the Darkling. And she doesn't know what's happening. She doesn't remember anything. She just wants to know that Mal's okay. She finally sees that he is, but he's looking at her in a very, very strange way. And she, she kind of questions like, what's going on? And it turns out that the bright flash of light, in fact, came from her. And this bright flash of light is a sign that Alina is a Grisha after all. And Alina has these magical abilities. So she is taken to the palace to be trained with the Grisha. She is now having to make her way in a world that most people have been a part of since they were children. And she knows nothing about she slowly starts to get closer to the Darkling, but as she does, she starts to realize that his interest in her might not be to her benefit after all. So this is a story of magic. It's a story of betrayal. Um, it's a wonderful series that just kind of draws you in and grips you at every moment. As I said at the beginning, the TV show is going to incorporate this story, as well as the Six of Crows story, which takes place in the same universe, in the same world, but with different characters. So I'm very curious to see how they meld those two stories together. They take place at different times. Six of Crows takes place not many years after, but a few years after the Shadow and Bone story does. And they reference back to it. And at times there are characters that appear from the earlier series in Six of Crows. So I'm I'm very curious to see kind of how how they're going to mix the two together. Uh, so yeah, so I'm very excited about this. Um, my husband has also read this series and loves it as much as I do, which I found kind of funny and wonderful at the same time. So we are both <laughs> very excited um, for this to come out. So that is Shadow and Bone by Lee Bardugo. I love why YA adaptation in particular and I feel like Netflix has done a lot of really great ones I will definitely watch maybe try to read beforehand nice nice do it do it <laughs> excellent all right well Virginia for our final book to tv or movie adaptation what did you bring us today all right, so my book adaptation has actually already come out a couple of weeks ago on Netflix. So you can go watch that. 
and tell me how it is because I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> and so, um, but I do have to point out um, fun fact for the director is that he is actually um, a friend of the author. And in fact, the book is actually dedicated to that director. So assuming that they know each other well and, and that he has read in fact, the first draft of the book before the book was published. So I'm assuming that he was able to bring the spirit of the book to the movie. So probably a good adaptation. And just like Corinne said, anything that brings people to read the book, excellent. That's the one good thing about adaptation in my book. So anyway, so the one that I've chosen is the winner of the Man Booker Prize in 2008. And it is The White Tiger by Aravind Adiga. Now, this is a story of Baram Hawai, and the framing of the book is him writing a series of letters to the premier of China, who is coming to India to visit, to learn about how to make entrepreneurs. India is full of them, and so China wants to learn how that works. And Baram thinks that, if there's one person who knows how that works, it's him. And that none of the ambassadors, none of those glossy pamphlets that the Chinese premier is going to get is going to really tell him the secret. So he wants to write the letters to him to explain how this works. The story chronicles starting from his life in when he grows up in Laxmangard, which is one of the rural villages like many other rural village in India, that is in the India that he calls the darkness. There is two Indias, in fact, there's the darkness and there's the light. And anyone who grew up, who was born in darkness, has this instinct, has this desire to serve. You know that your life purpose is to be a servant to your master. And it is so ingrained in you that Balram uses sort of the metaphor that it's like you're in a rooster coop. And this rooster coop doesn't even need a lock. It doesn't need a guard. No roosters will ever get out because it is ingrained in them that that is what you are supposed to do in life. And of course, Balram is the one that breaks out of the rooster coop and so he feels that he is qualified to explain to the Chinese premier what it is like to be a self-made man in India. Starting from learning how to drive and then becoming the driver of the local landlord's son and his wife who have just came back from America and how he made sure that they chose him to go with them to Delhi. And then in Delhi, that's when he learned and that's when he sees the darkness and how that is so different from the light and all the people that are still in darkness and bring that darkness with them and that can never get out. And he talks about how he manages to get out. Now, The White Tiger has actually been compared to another book called Q&A, which you may know better as another book adaptation, Slumdog Millionaire. And in that book, we also have a protagonist who probably also grew up in darkness. But there we have this feel-good story of a character who got out of it through this quiz show. And in the movie adaptation of The White Tiger, apparently it referenced that moment and it said, there is no miracle, magical quiz show that's going to get you out of it. Because Balram knows the only way to get out of darkness is through crime and politics. So this provides that counterpoint to what India is like in this age where you got all these companies from the West coming in to set up their companies and how there's supposedly all this advances, but all of that means nothing to the people who come from darkness and how that perpetuate inequalities, how it feeds into that system, and how the people that live there, just there's no way for them to get out of it. The book is funny. It's probably going to be pretty offensive to quite a lot of people. And I don't know if the way that Balram gets out of it is a good thing or not, but it definitely shed lights on that system that, that he lives in and, and how 
how well established and how well oiled that is. I think the best part of the book for me is when Baram himself and and his sort of very sardonic kind of voice and and when he describes and when he philosophizes about the little things that sort of give you that look into the inner workings of of this rooster coop, even like just little things like the first time he uses toothpaste. The first time that he brushed his teeth, just how he described those little bits really give you like sort of a sense of what it is like and how how brutal it is to be in this world. So I I quite enjoy the book. If you're looking for sort of a book that gives you like different points of view, you know, like this might be one of them that you can check out, and then probably check out Q and A and other books by authors in India. So again, this is the White Tiger by Aravind Adiga. Wonderful. Thank you, Virginia. I'm like kind of sad that the sun is shining so much today. Like I was so excited, but now all I want to do is like cuddle up and watch TV adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's not the day for it, though. It's not. <laughs> Maybe find some sort of uh, chair that you can sit outside and connect to your Wi-Fi and stream in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, read a book. I guess. Or read a book <laughs> or yeah, dive back into the world in book form. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone so much for indulging my love of adaptations. Uh, we did not even start to talk about the stage adaptations that have been made of books. So maybe that's another episode. Maybe uh, our next one will be about uh, plays and musicals that are based on books. <laughs> Kareen does not like that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll, maybe we'll take this one offline. We might take this one offline. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for watching us today. And thank you uh, to all of my colleagues for joining in on our discussion and existential crises um, as they come. And don't forget to tune in again next week for another episode of Keep It Fictional. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then, keep it fictional.